There's something supremely wholesome and nostalgic about a toy train set. Like many of you, I'm sure, I had a simple OO scale setup when I was but a wee boy. Uh, in my case, the superb Flying Scotsman set that you can see on the screen right now. And despite over two decades passing since I received this set one Christmas morning, I don't seem to have matured at all. It's still fun to set this little layout up and uh, watch the trains go round. One thing that has changed since I was little is that I'm now in a position where maybe I'll be able to build something a little more reliable than this trusty oval on the carpet. Hello everyone, thanks very much for joining me for the first video in a short series detailing the build of a small N-gauge end-to-end layout. This is intended very much as a build log rather than any kind of tutorial. I'm just going to show you the way I'm doing things and I'm sure I've probably not done it the best way so take everything I do with a bit of a pinch of salt but um, I'm hoping that this series might inspire you to build your own layout particularly if you don't have a lot of space like me. And um, yeah, I'm going to show you that you can build something functional in a very small amount of space. So without any further ado, let's get started with the thrilling tale of a grown man playing with some model trains. Our story starts earlier this year when, like many people, I was in the midst of some lockdown boredom and spending far too much of my time on YouTube looking at diorama building and Warhammer painting and all sorts of other hobby videos. I know what a crazy life I live, right? And I found my interest getting piqued by model train channels like uh, Sam's Trains and others. And it was at that point that I went searching for my old train set, which you saw at the start of the video. So after seeing all of these YouTubers making model railway layouts, I started to think about what I could achieve. And I had some very grand plans for a big loop of OO gauge track and um, all the scenery that would come with it. Because I wanted to kind of capture that nostalgia of, of when I was a kid and letting the Scotsman roam free. But unfortunately she's just a bit too big and girthy for the space I have available. I did think about putting something under my bed or, or maybe in the garage, but... I thought it was just going to be a bit tedious to have to move it around and potentially damaging it. So the next thing I looked at was N-Gage. Now N-Gage is essentially half scale of what we would call normal train scale, which is OO. So I've got two comparable 060s here, uh, N-Gage obviously in my right hand and OO gauge in my left. And N-Gage is half the size. This means that for the same amount of track, it will actually take up a quarter of the space. And for me, who's very space limited, that was uh, too much for me to give up on. Now, N-Gage is, is very small, but um, by all accounts has been coming on leaps and bounds in the last few years in terms of both detail and performance. And you can even get DCC ready engines. And uh, this even this tiny little 060 has space in the cab for a DCC chip. So I decided I'm going to build my layout in N-Gage. So once I decided upon a scale, I began looking online into track plans to try and get a little bit of inspiration. And one thing I came across was a, a little layout called the Ingle Nook Shunting Puzzle. This is a, a very small layout that has some operational interest by having a bit of a game attached to it where in the top right hand siding you've got five wagons and the game basically is to rearrange a total of eight wagons that are distributed between that and the center siding and there are a couple of limits to what you can do so you can only have three wagons out um, on the engine at one time and the bottom siding can only take three wagons as well so I kind of like the idea of this because it's, it's very small and also it actually gives me a reason to interact with the layout and, and do something with it that's entertaining. So I basically began looking into 
what that Inglenook would look like uh, when turned into real track. And I came up with this layout here, which is 800mm long by 200mm wide. I've drawn this in the AnyRail uh, track planning software. I've got the full version, but if you were planning a small layout like this, it fits within the part limit. I think that you can use 50 parts or something like that. Uh, so you would be able to plan a layout like this on the free version. Um, but yeah, this is what I end up, ended up with. And as you can see, it is essentially just an Inglenook layout with an extra siding on the left-hand side. And that siding is really just there to slightly disguise the fact that it is a simple Inglenook setup. The track does connect to the outside world through a tunnel on the uh, far left hand side and this makes the track look a little bit more realistic rather than it just being plonked in the middle of a baseboard and it also means if I do want to make a fiddle yard I can bring rolling stock and engines in from the left hand side and rearrange them in my sidings. I did double check the sidings were the right size by modelling up some wagons so you can see the top sidings can take five and then the uh, middle and the bottom one can take three each. I also decided at this stage that I wanted to try and eliminate the hand of God uh, from the layout as much as possible. So I'm going to achieve that by having Pico point motors to move the points around and I'm also going to use Dapple easy shunt magnetic couplers which allow you to kind of passively couple and decouple wagons without having to get your hand in there. So let's get started with the baseboard build. I headed out to the garage in the distant past of February of this year, armed with the uh, finest pine and ply that b &Q has to offer. The plan was just to build a simple four-sided box with a uh, 9mm ply acting as the lid. As you can see I've dived in headfirst and forgot to record any of that process, so uh, here we are seeing me sanding down the box ready for paint. Uh, in terms of putting it together, it was a very simple screw and glue job, um, really just kind of chopping all the bits out and, and putting them together, it, it was nothing special. And uh, as you can see, the uh, snow was still falling while I was uh, sanding, but because uh, I'm an absolute badass that didn't stop me. So here I'm using some Good Home brand Emulsion House paint primer. Uh, it's gets applied in a few coats with a uh, roller similar to how you would do a wall in a house. Um, I was looking on the b and website for the best brand and it seems all of them have at least a couple of bad reviews so I picked the one with the nicest tin and it seems to be doing pretty well. It rolls on really nice. Um, after coming from the world of miniature painting and, and model kits, this stuff you can really slap on pretty heavily and then smooth out with the roller so it's pretty quick to go on and uh, you get a really nice finish with it. So I felt like I'd done a pretty good job uh, sanding the first time round but as usual once you apply your primer it does tend to highlight a few of the issues so I went over these little gaps with some wood filler and uh, let that dry and then came back and started attacking the thing with uh, some more filing and uh, sanding and basically went through that process once again. It was pretty cold outside so I've donned my very fetching blue boiler suit and hobo gloves and really I was hoping to get all of this done and get it to a quality I was happy with because I wanted this to be the last time I had to paint the baseboard. This left me with something I was a lot happier with. The paint itself actually helps a fair bit to fill in some of the gaps so I'd uh, even the little knot I'd got filled in quite well and then it was um, back to reapplying the paint so gave everything a kind of light sanding with uh, some 600 odd grit sandpaper even on the top surface that just makes sure the paint's got something nice to key into and then I'm painting the top half but also the the bottom side as well so I flipped the whole thing over uh, and painted the inside as well. Once all that was done I gave obviously let the whole thing dry and then gave the primer a quick sand again with 600 odd grit sandpaper and then uh, went about applying the top coat so this is a color called vents uh, from good home gave that a quick google apparently it means expires or leg it in spanish uh, not sure if that bodes well for the project but um we're gonna soldier on regardless it's a nice shade of 
deep blue, um, but it's not too strong because I don't want to draw the uh, eye too far away from the railway itself. Uh, and again, this was a process that took the best part of a day or so, but I ended up with a finish I was really happy with. Unfortunately, um, after a little bit more thinking, I realized I hadn't really uh, come up with a very good plan for what my baseboard was going to look like, so I wanted to add a lid to the underneath, and basically I'm just here creating a lip in MDF that the lid's going to be able to sit down on, and that means it's time to bring out our old friend Mr. Circular Saw. This bad boy is an absolute beast, despite being battery powered, it really chews through all of these sheet materials. So you can also see I'm using this big long aluminium guide, that's from Machine Mart. Basically it's just a big square section of, of aluminium that you can clamp to whatever you're working on. As I'm just using a freehand circular saw. That helps me get everything straight, so I use that to actually make the baseboard itself. It's really essential to keep things neat. You'll also periodically see me flip-flop between wearing a dust mask and not wearing a dust mask, and you should definitely wear one because after chopping up a few bits of MDF and not wearing it, I felt like I had the lungs of a 65-year-old meth addict. Once they were all cut out, basically it was just time to glue it all into the inside edge of the baseboard and uh, as it's only going to be working in compression and it won't be taking any load really, I'm just going to glue it on without using any screws because it's a bit awkward to get my drill in to go from the inside and obviously I don't want to screw from the outside and have a visible screw head so I'm just spreading the PVA on with a brush and then pushing the blocks into their position. I know we all love a fun bit of PPE chat, but another little tip is to have a clean pair of gloves to work in when you're doing woodwork, particularly with MDF, because a couple of times I use my gloves, which I use for working on the car, and this stuff just soaks up the oil and you can't get it out again, and it means you have to put a fair bit more paint on to cover up the stain, so definitely have a nice clean pair of gloves for doing this kind of work. Once they're all in position I hold them in place with the random assortment of clamps that I have and uh, also some weights to uh, keep them in the right position while the glue sets. We're going to move away from woodworking just for a second and start looking at a little bit of a 3D printed detail here. This is a bezel that I'm going to use for getting power in and out of the baseboard. So we basically have um, one of them is the track input and the other one is uh, power for the point motors and this gives me a nice way to basically plug everything in uh, without having to have nasty holes in the baseboard. It does mean however I'm going to have to have a cutout for the actual bezel itself which you can see me putting together here. Basically starting off with the standard drill bits and working my way up using a countersink here and there to try and stop uh, the amount of splitting that I get and uh, also breaking out the spade bits which mean I can make a much bigger hole because my biggest drill bit is a 10mm but my spade bits go up to about 30mm so once the bulk of that's done I'm going to get the final shape with uh, a file, a rasp file. Obviously my even a spade bit makes a circle and this cutout needs to be a uh, kind of tic-tac shape so can't really uh, get the final product with those tools so I'm using uh, the file which we just saw and then a sanding drum on my Dremel tool to uh, try and get the final shape correctly and uh, yeah there we have it the bezel just slots in there um, it's not glued in, it's actually bolts in from the other side. Um, I'm really trying to keep things so that they can be disassembled quite easily. So the next detail we're going to look at is these little brass inserts. 
basically to fit them we're going to drill a hole and that outside uh, teeth are going to self-tap a, a big chunky thread basically and let the insert itself get driven in. And we're going to use these because the layout's very small and one of the benefits of that is that it's easy to move around. But um, I don't want to not be able to move it around because I'm scared of it getting damaged because obviously the whole thing's going to be very delicate. So my idea eventually is to have some kind of big, probably wooden um, lid kind of like the top of a box which is going to fit over the whole thing and then it will bolt into these inserts to keep it secure so I'm putting two in the back one on each side I'm not going to have any on the front because I don't want to have um, those visible inserts and that will give me a nice neat way to to bolt everything up so I've basically drilled up through some some drill bit sizes up to about seven mil I think and then I'm countersinking it as you can see there that's just to make sure that the head uh, can go in and sit flush or sub flush and yeah so the way you wind them in there's there's a hex feature which is slightly larger than the thread in the top of the insert so you can put in a allen key or I'm using a, a hex bit in my socket driver here and then once they start biting they'll um, just pull themselves in quite nicely and they uh, I think they look really neat once they're in they look like a very professional way to have a a nice thread in uh, obviously in baseboards as I'm using here, but I've used them for other woodworking projects too and I really like them. So the addition of that shelf means the whole thing needs painting again unfortunately. I'll uh, save you having to re-watch the process, but it's essentially the same steps as before. And you can see there the uh, shelf where the, the lid is going to sit, and I'm hoping it's going to look nice and tidy when it's done. One thing I am going to do, uh, as you can see here, is I'm using some self-adhesive foam tape and I'm going to put that all the, around the perimeter where the lid is going to fit. That's going to stop the lid from rattling around and also give us something to pre-tension up against when we bolt the whole thing. So if my uh, sort of shelf isn't exactly level, which I'm sure it isn't, then this foam tape is going to take up some of that tolerance and make sure that the lid sits down nice and flat. It also means maybe it would do something if you know some water was spilled on it or something like that it might help to seal it and uh, here I'm just offering up the lid which I've cut out of a little I think it's five mil a bit of ply. In regards to attaching the lid I'm planning on having four plinths one in each corner you can see them here I've printed them out on my ender three and to get thread in these parts, I'm using some thermoset inserts, which are really cool. To get these to work, you basically print your hole slightly undersized to the insert, and then they're designed to sort of melt in to the part, so they form a very strong bond. And uh, you just do that with a soldering iron, like I'm doing here, and apply light pressure, and then you get a nice metal thread in your part. I just glued these down to the baseboard, as you can see here and I'm running around a piece of extruded foam with a scalpel. That's going to form the actual topper to the baseboard and that's what the track's going to bond onto. Having this foam layer means that the track doesn't necessarily have to be the lowest point of the baseboard. We've got something we can sort of carve out. And it also gives me something pliable to poke things into, um, you know, fences, signposts, and that kind of stuff when it comes time to put scenery on. So with the basis of the baseboard completed, it's time to start thinking about getting some track together. The track plan is very, very simple, as we went through before. Uh, we've essentially got three sets of points forming up the kind of uh, foundation that everything else comes out from. We've got three sidings on the right hand side, one siding on the bottom left hand side, and then the track that joins to the outside world underneath the bridge. So really I just have five pieces of track I need to cut out. Here I am measuring up some track. I basically figured out how long it needs to be by uh, drawing everything out on the foam and then picking my links from there. I've actually got the track in the kitchen which is just next to this uh, to the back garden here so I'm going in and out and uh, checking the links. Here you can see it 
just set up on the table there with um, everything kind of roughly in place. Obviously it's all not bent to shape yet but kind of shows the general concept of, of where everything's going to be and it just allows me to double check I've got my sidings the right length. So I've put five uh, wagons in the top siding, then three in the middle and three in the bottom just to double check that everything's the right length. And with that all sorted I couldn't resist getting the uh, engine out and having a little play. I've just kind of pushed the track together and uh, it's all actually being fed just from one set of leads on the left hand side. But um, it all seemed to work reasonably well considering that's uh, the only electrical input to the circuit. And, yep, had a little bit of fun moving some wagons around and uh, feeling like a ten year old again. Who knew it could be so much fun moving tiny little wagons around. So, we've made some pretty good progress so far. The baseboard's all done, it's been cut out and painted and assembled. We've also cut the track out, and we've even managed to run an engine. The next stage is actually getting the track fastened down onto the baseboard, and for that we have to do everyone's favourite thing and start thinking about the electronics and the wiring. So, let's have a look at the layout and figure out where our dropper wires are going to go. As this is primarily a DCC layout, the position of the dropper wires, which are shown as red and black dots here, is pretty simple. Basically, every piece of track that can be separated by a set of points needs to have power fed to both of its rails. The key thing here is to be consistent with their position. In this case, I'm keeping the negative wire at the back, and uh, as long as we follow that, fingers crossed everything should be fine. Another thing to note is that because I'm using electrofrog points, the center rails of all the sets of points need to be isolated by the use of insulated rail joiners, because otherwise we'll have short circuits. Unfortunately, I can't show you the rail joiners mounted to a point because all of mine are being used on the layout, but using this curved piece as a substitute, here you can see a normal metal fish plate on the right hand side and an insulated rail joiner on the left. Now that we know where the wires need to go, we just have to run through and do quite a lot of soldering to get all of those dropper wires in the right place. Uh, basically involves removing a little bit of plastic from the rails and then soldering the wires into the right place onto the side of the rail. I really should have done it to the bottom of the rail but um, I was struggling to get my soldering iron in there so it does mean that um, some of the kind of solder blobs in the top of the wires are actually going to be visible on the track which is a little bit annoying but uh, it's not the end of the world. Here you can see um, I'm using white wires for the wire that powers the frog on the points and I've used black and red wires for the actual power feed. I decided to solder the two center points together, which was not a good idea. Um, I don't really know why I wanted to do that, but um, yeah, they're fixed together. Um, but for the rest of the track, I've just pushed the fit fish plates on either side and just counted on that basically to keep them together. Soldering the track might make sense if you had lots of little splits and you didn't want to put droppers on all of them, but for me, the um, each piece of track has droppers to it anyway, so I'm not actually relying on any of the joiners to carry power. One benefit of having those two sets of points soldered together is it did give me a nice base to work from, and here I'm offering up all the track to the foam baseboard and I'm just poking holes in it with a little uh, screwdriver or some other implement I had laying around and that's so I can poke the positive and negative power feeds through. I've got some foam offcuts keeping the, the, the main foam board up and above the, the actual wooden baseboard and that's so that all the wires getting poked through don't kind of get all squished as I'm playing around with it 
uh, they are silicon wires and uh, they are flex wire as well so they can be bent to pretty good angles but still you don't really want to be stressing it more than it needs to be done so I'm kind of going through you can see me sort of flashes of me pinching the the rail joiners with a set of pliers and that's just because I wanted to get a little bit of um, tension there so that they would hold themselves in place and not kind of wander around too much while I was fiddling around with the rest of the track and in an ultimate show of bodgy laziness I'm actually going to use the heated bed off of my 3D printer to keep the track in a straight line and you can also see me there using calipers to keep this space between the sidings consistent. Once I was happy with the position of the track I took it all off, off of the foam and then spread out some PVA, scored the back of the foam and uh, got it all bonded on. Put some weights on it to keep it in place. So now I've marked up my foam and I've poked holes through it for all the wires. I'm going to use those holes as a guide for drilling through the 9mm plywood lid of the box. And then flipping the box over I'm going to open out those holes just a tiny bit and I'm also going to use a countersink bit to add a chamfer to the underside. That means that the wires, once they get pulled through, they're not going to be getting pulled over a sharp corner as they transition to the underside of the box. That just leaves the holes for the rods that move the points. I'm poking those through and then I'm going to remove the track and drill them out once again with a drill bit. This time I'm going to actually open up the holes a fair bit because obviously the uh, push rod needs to move side to side so I'm going to use a larger drill bit, I think I went up to a 5 or a 6 mil there to give myself some room for the push rods to move. Next I'm going to offer all the track up to the foam and the baseboard and this is a pretty satisfying job of pushing the wires through, connecting up the fish plates and then uh, pulling the wires down and uh, the friction of the wires actually holds the track in place quite nicely. And there we have our track all assembled down on the foam. So that's where we're going to wrap up this episode. We've got the baseboard built, even if it took us a couple of goes and painting it three or four times. We've got it tracked down, um, the wiring has been put onto the track, although it's not all connected up yet. And we've even managed to run a couple of engines. Next time we're going to get a little bit more technical as we're looking at wiring up the track, including the point motors. And we're also going to put the magnets in for the dapple decouplers. So thanks again for joining me and I hope to see you next time.